conic sections. What are they? Well, as the name suggests, they are nothing but sections of a cone. Yes, when you have a double cone and you slice it using a plane, what you obtain are plain simple curves called conic sections or conics. So what did you understand? Intersecting a double-sided right circular cone with a plane at different different orientations generates a variety of two-dimensional curves called conics. But before I give you a visual treat of how these conics are created, let's quickly spend some time in understanding a few prerequisites. See, consider a fixed line L and also another line M intersecting it at point V, making an angle alpha with it. Okay, so the scene is that the line M is hinged with the line L at point V. Mind it, L is a fixed line. It's not allowed to move. M on the other hand is a movable line. Now what you are supposed to do is flick the movable line M. What did I say? Flick the movable line M. When you do that, you will see that the line M starts rotating about the line L. Did you see that? Yes. The line M starts rotating about the line L such that Throughout its rotation, the angle alpha remains constant. As a result, you can imagine very, very clearly that a right circular cone gets created above the point V and simultaneously a right circular cone gets created below the point V. Altogether, what you get is this surface which is a double-sided, hollow, right circular cone extending infinitely far from both upward and downward directions. Alright, this is how you create a double cone. In here, this fixed line L about which the rotation was happening is called the axis of the double cone. The point V is called the vertex, which is going to play a vital role in classifying conics. Also, you can evidently see that the point V, which is the vertex, is separating this entire double cone into two symmetrical parts. Each one of them is called a nap. The right circular cone lying above the vertex is called the upper nap and the one lying below is called the lower nap. Also, the circular face at the bottom of the double cone is called its base. And lastly, you know that the line M, which was the movable line, actually rotated to give you this double cone, isn't it? That means this, the curved surface of this double cone, I can say, is the locus of my movable line M. That is why this line M is called the generator line because it is generating the double cone. Got it? Now, let's move ahead. Please recall that intersecting a double cone with a plane generates 2D curves called conics. Yes? Now, the moment you have the double cone and the plane with you, the agenda now is to perform their intersection. Why? Because obviously we are interested in visualizing the formation of conics. Right? And for that, you and I together are going to perform an activity wherein we will be slicing this double cone in multiple fashions using the plane. Because I want you to observe carefully that the moment I change the orientation of the cutting plane, the conic that I get as a result also changes. Yes. In fact, you know what? I am going to share with you some specific orientations of the cutting plane corresponding to which you will get the prettiest and the most useful conics. So, should we start the activity? Well, before that, just one disclaimer. Please note that the intersection of a plane and a double cone can happen in two ways. 
One is when the plane does not pass through the vertex of the double cone and second when the plane does pass through the vertex of the double cone. We will be exploring each of these scenarios one by one. Beginning with the case when the plane intersects the double cone but is not allowed to pass through its vertex. In here, the very first orientation we are interested in is when the plane is kept parallel to the base of the cone. Yes, you have to keep the plane perfectly horizontal such that it makes a 90 degree angle with the axis of the cone. Keeping this to be the orientation of the plane, when you slice off the double cone, what you obtain is this beautiful orange colored 2D curve, which is nothing but a circle. Yes, to convince you more on this, I'll show you the top view. Can you see? It's a perfect circle. Let me show you the bottom view as well. Again, a perfect circle. Got it? In fact, you know what? If I keep on changing the position of the plane, okay, what am I doing? I am changing the positions of the cutting plane without disturbing its orientation of being parallel to the base of the cone. What I am getting each time is a circle. Alright. Yes. If I restrict the movement of the plane in just the upper nap, what do we observe? As I'm moving more and more upward along the upper nap, the circle is becoming larger and larger. Can you see? The radius of the circle is increasing. And on the other hand, if I am moving more and more closer towards the vertex, the size of the circle is reducing. Basically, the circle is getting smaller and smaller. Its radius is reducing. Did you see? Similarly, let's now restrict ourselves to the movement of the plane in the lower nap. What do you observe? As I'm moving more and more downward, I'm getting a bigger and bigger circle. And as I am moving my cutting plane more and more closer towards the vertex, what I'm getting is a smaller circle. But all in all, the major takeaway from here is that no matter what the position of the cutting plane is, as long as the orientation is that it is kept parallel to the base of the cone, it will always end up giving you a circle. Do you get it? Yes. Now, one little disclaimer before I move ahead. In order to obtain a circle, the cutting plane was entirely cutting across one single nap at a time. Either just the upper nap or just the lower nap. Keep this in mind. Okay? The next orientation we are interested in is when the plane is no more parallel to the base but is slightly tilted, slightly slant to the base of the cone. You know, something like this. Keeping this to be the orientation of the plane, when you slice off the double cone, what you end up getting is this vibrant colored two-dimensional curve, which is nothing but an ellipse. Can you see that? It's a wonderful ellipse. You know, it's like when the plane was parallel to the base, you were getting a circle. The moment you tilt the plane a little, the circle gets distorted. Okay, it kind of gets stretched. And what it gives you is a ellipse. Okay, I'll show you the top view. Can you see it's no more a circle? It's an ellipse. Similarly, the bottom view also you can see it's an ellipse. Kind of a stretched circle. Yeah? Now, let me do something. I'm going to keep the orientation of the plane exactly the same. But let me vary the positions. Let me vary its positions. Can you see? Each time I am varying the position of the cutting plane, keeping its orientation to be the same, which is slightly tilted to the base of the cone, I am getting the same conic ellipse each single time. In fact, 
if i move more and more above along the upper nap i am getting a larger ellipse and as i move my cutting plane more and more closer towards the vertex the size of the ellipse reduces similarly as i move my cutting plane more and more downward along the lower nap what i get is a larger and larger ellipse and as i move my cutting plane more and more towards the vertex i am going to get a smaller ellipse did you see it all in all the major take away from here is that as long as you are keeping the orientation of the cutting plane to be slightly tilted to the base of the double cone their intersection is going to always end up giving you an ellipse understood now the disclaimer just like in the case of circles we saw exactly same disclaimer prevails here as well in order to obtain an ellipse the plane has to entirely cut across one single nap at a time just the upper nap or just the lower nap all right the third orientation is this when the plane is kept perfectly parallel to the edge of the cone keeping this to be the orientation of the cutting plane when you slice off the double cone what you end up getting is this beautiful red colored two dimensional curve which you all know is a parabola you've seen it multiple times in the quadratic equations chapter so you are familiar with its figure it is a parabola can you see it it's so wonderful in fact you know what now what you do is you keep on changing the position of the cutting plane let's do that see i'm not going to disturb the orientation of the plane i'm just keeping the same orientation and changing the positions of the cutting plane you can see each time i am getting the exact same conic parabola can you see that yes okay so the take away from here is that no matter what the position of the cutting plane is as long as its orientation is that it is placed parallel to the edge of the double cone their intersection will always end up giving you the conic parabola and again the disclaimer which existed in circle in ellipse also prevails in parabola what does it say in order to obtain a parabola the plane should entirely cut across one single nap at a time either just the upper nap or just the lower nap all right so till now we are through with three conics circle ellipse and parabola and in all these three there was one thing common in order to generate them the plane was supposed to entirely cut off a single nap only either just the upper or just the lower now in my fourth and the last orientation for the first time i am going to keep my plane in such a way that when it slices off the double cone both the upper and the lower nap get intersected simultaneously you know something like this in doing so the curve that you obtain looks like this can you see that it's an open curve having two branches it's called a hyperbola each of these branches are called the arms of the hyperbola mind it it's not two opposite facing parabolas which are getting combined to give you this hyperbola no this curve individually is one single curve in itself it has its own equation its own set of properties which we are going to study later on in this chapter but for now please keep in mind that as long as my plane is intersecting both the upper and the lower nap i am going to continue getting a hyperbola can you see that yes now one thing which is very evident to observe is that the hyperbolas that we are getting are not symmetric hyperbolas can you see the upper and the lower arm are not looking symmetric if you want to get a symmetric hyperbola what you are supposed to do is keep the plane such that on slicing of the double cone yes it intersects both the naps 
but it should also be perpendicular to the base of the cone. Doing so, the hyperbola that you get will be a beautifully symmetric hyperbola. All right, and with this, we are through with the four conics, circle, ellipse, parabola, and hyperbola, which fall under the first scenario wherein the cutting plane was not allowed to pass through the vertex of the double cone. Let's now enter and explore the second scenario wherein the cutting plane is allowed to pass through the vertex of the double cone. Now in here, I'm going to use the same four orientations. The first one is when the plane is kept parallel to the base of the cone and this time it's passing through the vertex as well. So the intersection that you get is this singular orange colored point that you can see. Yes. Moving on to the second orientation, when you tilt the plane a little. Can you see that? I've tilted the plane and I've made it to pass through the vertex. What is the intersection you are getting? It's a singular green colored point that you can see here. So the intersection is again coming out to be a point. Let's move on to the third orientation, okay? Wherein the plane was parallel to the edge of the cone and mind it, it is passing through the vertex. So in this scenario, what you get as the intersection is a perfectly straight line. Can you see that? You get a perfectly straight line, which many books also describe as two coincident lines. So you can either say a single straight line or two coincident lines is what you get in this case. Moving on to the fourth orientation, when the plane has to intersect both the naps and also is supposed to pass through the vertex. What this gives you is this. Can you see? These are a pair of intersecting straight lines. Okay? Did you understand? So as long as the plane is passing through the vertex and is also intersecting both the naps of the double cone, you will get a pair of distinct straight lines which are intersecting at a single point. So with this, we are through with our discussion of the three conics which are generated when the plane passes through the vertex of the double cone. They are a singular point, a single straight line or two coincident lines and a pair of intersecting lines.